Well, bless the Lord, everybody. It's Sunday. It's another day that we get to worship and focus on God. Even though we worship Him every day, and we will be talking about worship, uh, but corporately we're coming together online uh, to give God glory and to delve into His Word. Last week we started a series on what everyone needs to know about praise and worship. And we talked about praise last week, and we talked about praise being uh, our ability to vent and to give voice of how we feel about God. Uh, we said that praise is never uh, introverted, it's always extroverted. And then we had also said that praise is the vehicle that takes us to the destination of worship. And so we want to go further uh, into that today. And today we're going to talk about worship. So I want you to grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 95. We're going to read from verse 1 down to verse 7. And as you're preparing for that, I also just want to let you know that on December, the first Sunday in December, I believe that's December the 6th, we're going to be having a baptismal service. Bless the Lord. Uh, there are some people that have expressed uh, their desire to be baptized. And, and so I just want to make a call and see if there's anyone else that has been watching us online um, that desires to be baptized through Kingsway Community Life Center. Uh, and if you do, I want you to reach out to us. Uh, you can reach out to us uh, through various forms. Uh, you can send an email to admin at kclcministries.org or you can call the church at 416-510-0700. Again, so you can send an email to admin at kclcministries.org or you can uh, call the church directly at 416-510-0700. Again, if you desire to be baptized, uh, there's going to be um, a baptismal class that will be online, and so uh, you'll get further information about that. But we're looking forward uh, to December the 6th. It's going to be a powerful service. Uh, amen. So if you got the Word of God, you got your smartphone, you got your Bible, however you read the Word of the Lord, uh, let's read God's Word. Psalm 95 says, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving thanksgiving let us shout joyfully to him with psalms for the lord is the great god and the great king above all gods in his hand are the deep places of the earth the heights of the hills are his also the sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land oh come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Amen. Bless the name of the Lord. So we're going to go further in our series talking about what everyone needs to know about praise and worship. And so we established yesterday, last week rather, the difference between praise and worship that Praise is extroverted, praise is gregarious, praise is loud, it's out there. And most of all, when it comes to God and when it comes to uh, the ministry of praise and worship, praise exists as that vehicle that takes us to the place of worship. So let's delve a little into worship. Now, I will say this, that uh, the, the topic of praise and worship is so vast. It is so vast that uh, it would take months, literally weeks to months, to really exhaust the topic and teaching on praise and worship. And so what we're doing is we're just scratching the surface and just giving you everything that you need to know so that you can really um, intensify your praise and intensify your worship and, and praise God intelligently. Amen. Uh, we know that God is in the, 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 the business of restoration. The Bible really is a record of God's attempts uh, to get man back into his presence. And 
therefore then, the stories that we read in the Bible throughout the Old Testament are not primarily then about patriarchs or judges or about prophets, even though we read narrative on that. Uh, the real essence of the Bible is then not about wars or victories and defeats. Uh, rather, the Bible can be summed up as an account of God's acts, the actions that God has taken to get man back into the ideal environment. Man has shifted from his placement and from the ideal environment. And the Bible uh, is an account of God's attempts, God's efforts to bring us back into the ideal environment. Uh, it tells of God's basic desire. The Bible really speaks of God's heart. And, and God's heart is really found in Exodus 25 and verse 8. He says, I want a place on earth where I can place my presence. I want a place on earth where I can place my presence again. And, and so really uh, the word of God and all of the happenings that we see, especially in the Old Testament, uh, are the efforts of God to bring us back into that place of where his presence dwells. Uh, God's desire is to rescue humanity because we've malfunctioned. The man that he created has malfunctioned and now God's efforts through his word is to rescue that malfunctioned machine named man. When we look at Eden, uh, Eden, the Garden of Eden, uh, was the perfect environment for man. Uh, and Eden itself, the name Eden means delight. It means pleasure. Uh, uh, it means the presence of God. It, it, it represented unbroken fellowship. So when we talk about Eden, we talk about a place where man is in harmony with God, where man is in sync with his creator. Uh, man is in the right environment. And, and environment really means conditions. Uh, environment is a climate uh, that is necessary for things to exist. When we talk about being in the right environment, it, it means being in a place uh, where things can thrive, where things can live. The right environment is, is so essential to us being successful in what we have been designed and called to do. And, and God created this environment and at the right time, he placed man in it uh, and really uh, man would function as God designed in that environment as long as he stays in the right environment he will thrive uh, he will be everything that God has designed him to be but we do understand that a product that is outside of the right environment will die you know the right environment for fish is what water the right environment for a plant is the soil. You don't take a plant and place it in water. You don't take fish and place them in the earth. It's the wrong environment. Nothing wrong with the water. Nothing wrong with the soil. Uh, but uh, the environment has to be conducive. And oftentimes our environment is not conducive to our success or to our living or to our thriving. And so it is important, it is crucial, and it is necessary if we are going to live our best life, if we are going to live by design and be everything that God intended for us to be, we've got to be in the right environment because we will malfunction if we are in the wrong environment. Being in the wrong environment equals wasted potential. Uh, you know, you can have great potential, you can have great gifting, but if you're not in the right environment for that gifting to shine and to come through to fruition, then that potential will be wasted, not because there's anything wrong with the gift or the potential or the idea, but that it won't work there. God tells Abraham uh, that I'm going to bless you, but he says, I'm not going to bless you here, I'm going to bless you there. He tells him, get out, because your environment is not conducive 
sensitive to the blessing that I have for you. And so environment is very uh, necessary and important to God. And with everything that we are going after, everything that you are seeking, you got to seek the right environment. You got to go after the presence of God because the presence of God, being in his presence is the right environment for man. It, it, is, it is synonymous to a fish being in water. It's synonymous to that plant and that tree being rooted and grounded in the earth. You will thrive when you are in the presence of God. And anything that we get without the presence of God will malfunction. Anything that we achieve without the presence of God will mal malfunction. So let's run after his presence. Let's desire more of his presence. And praise and worship brings to us the presence of God. And, and, and so as believers, we've got to be praisers and we definitely have to be worshipers. And, and, and so we see through the word of God that God's work to get man back into his destined environment or into his placement was realized and achieved through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gives us access to the original intention of God. Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, through salvation, he gives us access to everything that God had intended to, uh, for us. We understand that the first Adam, uh, he forfeited this assignment. He was placed on the earth to bring back the presence and the order of God into his world and into his society. And he forfeited that dominion, but Jesus succeeded. This is why our faith and our allegiance is to Jesus. This is why he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes back into access. No one uh, gets access to the original intention, thoughts, and plans of God except through him. This is the word of God. This is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot be qualified to receive the presence of God until we receive Jesus Christ. Jesus brings to us the presence of God. Uh, and, and, and through that, that's achieved through the working of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cleanses us and restores to us the presence of God in our lives. And the word of God says, Jesus declares that God is spirit. And they that worship must worship him in spirit or through the spirit and through the truth that the spirit brings to us. And, and so even our worship has to be spiritual. Our worship is through Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. Uh, worship. When we talk about worship, uh, humanity, every person has an urge to worship and everyone worships. That urge has always been there from the beginning of time. And when we look at biblical account, we see the first act of worship is recorded in Genesis chapter 4. This is right after the fall of man. The Bible says uh, that in Genesis 4, that in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel, Abel bought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now, both Cain and Abel brought offerings. They, they brought offerings. What were they attempting? What were they attempting? They were attempting connection with God. They understood enough to know that they needed to be in, in, in connection with God and that they were out of fellowship and out of connection with God. And that's what worship does. Worship brings us into connection with God. They knew that they needed to be in communion with God. Uh, and we see now through the Old Testament that this effort to be in connection with God is repeated. Uh, people built altars uh, and, and they prepared a place for God to dwell. Noah, Noah was the, the first one that built an altar after the flood. The word of the Lord says in Genesis 8 that the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma or worship. 
Because that's what worship is. Worship is an aroma. Uh, and after Noah had built that, that altar uh, and he had sacrificed on it and God had, had received the aroma of his offering because that's what worship is. It's an offering. God said that he would never again curse the ground. And then God blessed Noah and his son saying to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth. And so we see Noah attempting to make connection with God. Then we see Abraham. Abraham is the next person to build an altar to the Lord. Genesis chapter 12 records it, uh, you know, and we know that that altar that Abraham built was on Mount Moriah where God instructed him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Moses, moving along. Moses is the next person to build an altar. And so we're seeing the pattern here. It is all in an attempt to be in connection with God. Moses understood the necessity of God's presence. He understood it. He was tasked with the responsibility of leading a miserable, grumbling, and ungrateful set of people from bondage into the promised land. God had given him that task. God had told him, Moses, this is what I want you to do. Uh, and then Moses turns it around and he says to God, if your presence, if your presence does not go with us, don't send us up from here. He understood in order for him to be successful in any assignment or in any task, he needed the presence of God. And it's still the same today. We need the presence of God. Anything that you achieve outside of the presence of God will not work. It will not last. We need the presence of God. And, and so when we look at worship and we look at all of those examples that we've given so far, we see a willingness of those individuals to offer worship. We see a willingness for them or an effort for them to, to reach God and to touch God. Because that's what worship does. Worship touches God. Worship has to be willing. So if you're writing down, I want you to write that down, that worship must be willing. Turn with your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 25. We're going to go through a little bit of Bible study. Okay, Exodus 25, uh, verse 1, verse 3, and um, yeah, almost verse 1 to verse 1 to 8. Exodus 25 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering. From everyone, look at this, who gives it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. God tells Moses, speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to bring me an offering. But he says, hold up now. You're going to take it from only those that offer it willingly. Everyone that gives it willingly from their heart. Worship has to be willing. It, it cannot be forced because worship is intimacy. You can't force somebody to be intimate with you. That's called assault. And, and, and God is, is not into assault. He's not trying to receive anything that is forced. His worship and the worship that he receives must be willing. He says, uh, uh, from everyone who gives it willingly from his heart, you shall take my offering. Then they talk about the aspects of that type of offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver, bronze, purple, blue, scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair rams skins dyed uh, red badger skins and acacia wood oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and sweet incense onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate these were all items that were expensive these were all items of value there's another word that's connected with worship value Value has to be placed upon your worship. And so God tells them that these are the things, these valuable things are the things that you're going to present to me. Because that's what makes your worship effective when there is value placed on it. Amen. That's why Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's was, was refused because Abel's came through value. Cain gave God what was left. There was no value attached to it. And then God says to, to Moses in Exodus 25, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. 
That is the heart of God. Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell amongst them. Give me a space. That's what God is asking for. Provide me a room. I want to dwell with you. I created you for fellowship. That's the heart of God. He created us to be with us. And, 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 and through the fall and through Adam's fall, uh, we have lost and, and, and fellowship was broken. But from that time onward, God desired and looked intentionally for ways where he could bridge the gap and, and come back into contact and fellowship with mankind. Has to be willing. Willing worship then uh, flows from your intuition. There, there, there's an intuition. In, in, there's an, an instinct instinctive knowledge of God because all of us are created in the image of God our intuition is to worship and we worship God through intuition we worship God also through our conscience conscience uh, is the seat of all inspiration uh, it rests upon your heart when something rests on your conscience it's on your heart and, and our heart is involved in worship uh, it must be rested upon our heart. Our hearts are crying out for God. Circumstances around us and, and situations uh, uh, may try to pull us away from worship and from that connection with God. But every person in the quietness, uh, every believer in the quietness of their own mind and their own heart feels that drawing to the place of worship. Worship is communion. Worship is communion. Worship is exchange. It's exchange. That's what happens in intimacy. Worship is a coming together. You, you see the difference between praise and worship. Praise is at a distance. Uh, anybody can praise. Anyone can speak well of. But worship goes beyond praising. Worship goes beyond uh, articulation. Worship is estimation. We talked about that last week. Worship is touching. Worship is embracing I don't need to embrace you to praise you no no I can praise you from a distance I, I can speak well of you without really knowing you but worship uh, worship can only occur occur uh, through intimacy worship can only occur through touching songwriter says touching Jesus is all that matters then your life will never be the same uh, when we touch and when we embrace uh, there is an exchange and that is what worship is all about and so let's look at a worship definition Let's look at the definition of worship. So our English word worship comes from a word that means worth-ship or value. Value. It is the recognition of and a response to the worth or the action of another person. And, and so worship then means to recognize or to value another person and their actions. Psalm 96 verse 8 says, Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Ascribe, give unto the Lord. Recognize that he is worthy of glory. He is worthy of your offering. Worship is value. What do you value? Worship is placing your value on God. Let's look at some Hebrew words for worship. Last week we looked at some Hebrew words uh, for praise. Let's look at some Hebrew words for worship. The first word uh, is the word shaka. It's spelled S-H-A-C-H-A-H. -A, -A, mm, a lot of H's. Shaka. It means depress. Not that psychological um, state of being depressed, but it means to press down or to bow down. Or here's another word that we use, use in worship, prostrate. To prostrate yourself. Shaka means to bow down or to become low. Uh, to press yourself down. Uh, Exodus 4 says they bowed their heads and worshipped. In worship, we depress ourselves. We push ourselves down. What does Jesus say? What does, what does John say of Jesus? Uh, John says that uh, he must increase, but I must shakar. I must 
decrease. And in worship, we bow ourselves. We bow ourselves. We realize that God is so transcendent above everything that we are. Second word in the Old Testament that we use for worship is the word aboda. A-B-O-D-A-H. And aboda means service to a, to a superior. Uh, it means to serve a superior. Aboda. Exodus 3 says, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. That word serve is worship. Uh, and, and so worship is about service. Then there is the word kagda. Kagda. I'm going to spell it for you. It's C-A-G-H-A-D-H. -H. It's a Hebrew word. And this means now to fall down. It means to, to fall down. We fall down before you, God. We prostrate ourselves. We throw ourselves down. Uh, the Bible says in Job, Job chapter 1, that Job arose and he rent his mantle and, mantle and he shaved his head and he fell down on the ground and he worshipped. Uh, uh, Kagda means to fall to your knees in the presence of a superior, to recognize that somebody great has come into your vicinity somebody great is in your space and we fall before you though these are the words for worship in the old testament then we look at the new testament and there are two main uh, greek words for worship in the new testament and i i love these words the first one is proscunio 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 is spelled p-r-o-s-k-u-n-e-o and proscunio is a symbolic act. Proscunio means to kiss towards. It means uh, touching the hand to the lips and extending it in reverence or, 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 or obedience or to bow uh, toward the person that is being honored. And so proscunio means to blow kisses at God. Isn't that wonderful? When we worship, we are showing our affection to God. Uh, very different than praise. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, uh, worship is intimate because kissing is a sign of intimacy. You don't kiss anyone. Well, I hope you don't just go around kissing anyone. You kiss people that you are in relationship with. Ah, do, do you see that? Uh, proscunio means to kiss towards. It is a sign of affection. Now, let me show you right there an example of the difference between praise and worship. Now, praise is to speak well of. Praise is to applaud. Praise is to command. Praise is to brag about. Praise is extroverted. It's out there. It's gregarious. It's loud. Worship means to kiss. Worship means to kiss. Any and anyone can praise. I don't need to necessarily know you or be in relationship with you to praise you. I always use this example when I teach praise and worship. You know, so uh, there's, a, there, there, there's a young man that's standing at a bus shelter. Just go with me, go with me. Young man standing at the bus shelter and uh, a beautiful woman in his eyes, you know, uh, comes and stands at the shelter and he's looking at this lady that he does not know and he says, wow, your hair is amazing. You know, has anybody ever told you that you got beautiful eyes? Like you are such a beautiful person. Like, look at you. You are great now that young lady is going to respond she's probably going to blush she's going to say wow well, thank you right nothing inappropriate has happened he's praised her and, and she's accepted his words of commendation she's accepted him bragging about how wonderful her hair is how beautiful her eyes are he he you know she's fine with that he can stand where he is he can admire her and he can talk about her now the young man moves towards her gets into her personal space and tries to kiss her now what do you think is going to happen if that lady is a virtuous lady, listen, she's going to ball her fist and give him one. Yeah, you know exactly how that's going to go. She's going to call the police. This guy's just assaulted me. Why? Because I don't know you like that. That's exactly what she's going to say. And that's what you would say. Hold up, back up. We're not together. I don't know you. 
I, I, I'm not in relationship with you for you to be comfortable enough to come and touch me. Now, do you see the difference between praise and worship? You can stand from a distance and you can tell me how wonderful I am. You can, you can stand from a distance and tell me how great I am and how great I look and, you know, the acts that I've done that are so powerful. You can talk about what you know about me, but you can't touch me. You know, in, in the church, so many people, you know, they, they come out at Easter or at Christmas, uh, you know, they stand on award shows and they, they give praise to God. They're praising a God that they don't know. And that praise is acceptable and that praise is appropriate. But you're not in a relationship with God just because you praise God. I want you to catch that. Just because you can shout and you can dance and you can talk about, oh, God is good. God is amazing. Just because you rave about God does not mean that you are in a relationship with God. Raving and relationship are two different things. And we got a lot of people that rave, that talk the talk. But really worship is about relationship. Worship is knowing God from your heart. Not just talking about what God has done. Talking about how good God is. Raving about it. No, I don't want to be a raver. I want to be in a relationship with God. So proscunio is to kiss towards. Then the second uh, uh, New Testament Greek word that we have uh, for worship is latruo. Latruo. I'll spell it for you. L-A-T-R-E-U-O. Or the word liturgia. Uh, liturgia. L-E-I-T-O-U. R-G-I-A, and you can hear that word liturgy in it, uh, and that means service to God. Uh, that's where we get liturgy from, and liturgy means service. Uh, it means the work of God or doing the work of God. So worship is also to work for God. Worship is action. Worship requires work, not just standing at the sidelines and talking about how great he is, but getting involved in the service of God. And, and so as we work for God, we are worshiping God. You can't worship and not work. You can't worship and not work for God. You cannot worship. You can't call yourself a worshiper if you are not in the service of God. John chapter 4, Jesus says, My food or my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. That's what gives me life. That's what I feed myself on, Jesus said, to do the will of him who sent me. He says, I must work the works of him who who has sent me while it is day because the night comes when no man can work and so uh, from these definitions uh, both old and new testament definitions we can surmise that there is a dual aspect to worship so there is the attitude of heart and then the attitude of service that's what worship is about. That's the foundation of worship. Worship springs from a heart that's connected to God, that touches God, that kisses God, that is intimate with God. And then it springs from a heart that now works for God. It is an attitude of heart and it is an attitude of service. And so if the essence of Christianity is relationship, if that's what we talk about as being Christians, meaning that we are in a relationship with God, Christianity is a relationship, not a religion. You've heard that a lot of times. It's about being a relationship. If the essence of, uh, of Christianity is relationship, then the expression of that relationship is worship. Worship. What am I saying? You cannot be a Christian and not worship. There is no such thing. You cannot be a non-worshipping Christian. Every believer, every Christian is a worshipper. Every Christian has esteem and has value for God. Every Christian adores God. Adoration flows from our heart. We worship God. We work for God. We are in the service of God. Praise is articulation. I'm not downplaying praise, but praise is a vehicle that takes us to a destination. 
And, and so we praise God uh, in an effort to get to the place of worship. Praise is the preamble. It comes before. But praise is not fulfilled or praise goes nowhere if it's not consummated in worship. There has to be worship because there is a divine exchange in worship. And so you notice the bride and the groom on their wedding day she walks down the aisle to the praise of her groom and the praise of everyone that's around her and the groom and the bride exchange words and they talk about their love and you know they even write their own vows today and talk about how much they love each other and everyone is involved in that because it is loud it is it is gregarious it is extroverted it's out there we have a celebration of their love and they dance and they party and we eat food and, and so forth and all of that is the praise of their love now comes the honeymoon now comes the time where only the bride and the groom can attend to absolutely you don't take uh, your wedding party with you on honeymoon you don't take them into your chamber or into your bedroom and it is now in that chamber or in that bedroom that all the words that they've spoken spoken all the things that they've said about each other is consummated in the act of worship in the they worship each other they worship each other's body they are connected there is exchange in that and it is a beautiful thing and out of that exchange comes reproduction comes new life that's what worship is worship is intimacy can you imagine having a wedding day and having all of that praise and then going on your honeymoon and nothing lord jesus not a thing nothing happens no consummation you know by law you don't even need a divorce if you haven't consummated your wedding if you haven't consummated your marriage you, you can sign any document that you want you can say i'm married to that person but unless you partake in the act of consummation unless there is intercourse unless i can see into you and you see into me unless we can connect uh, on another level that nobody else uh, is allowed to connect on we have not worshipped uh, and this is not a real marriage uh, and we can have it annulled well that's in the natural how much more in the spirit uh, our God loves your praise uh, yes he's attracted uh, to your praise uh, and your praise uh, has seduced him uh, and brought him into the room uh, and brought him into your presence but he's in your presence for one reason he's there because he desires a divine exchange there are some things that he wants to deposit into your life there are some things that he wants to get to you and you've got to get out of the vehicle of praise and go to the place of worship where you touch God and you have God touch you where you give your life to God and he gives life to you that's the beauty of worship and that's what we're called to that's where the real power is at you got to go beyond the place of praise listen when you get into your vehicle you drive that vehicle for however long it takes for you to get to your destination but what do you do when you get to your destination you don't stay in that car you don't stay in that vehicle you turn the engine off and you go into your purpose you go into the purpose for the journey and worship hallelujah I feel worship already worship is the purpose for the journey worship is why I shout and I sing worship is why I tell God how wonderful he is because I know there's a moment coming where I will encounter him where there will be an exchange and if I don't encounter him then all I've done is entertain him and that's all a lot of us are doing we're just providing entertainment great entertainment because we can sing greater and we can play greater and we can dance greater but it's all 
entertainment uh, unless there is an encounter, unless there is a divine exchange, uh, unless there is a deposit, uh, unless you give him your life uh, and receive uh, his life. That's what worship uh, is all about. That's when worship uh, becomes spirit uh, and truth. It's a spirit uh, to spirit connection oh glory be to God I feel I feel worship right now as I teach this and, and right where you are just begin to lift your hands and say God I want to touch you up God I want to worship you I, I just want to be where you are in your dwelling place I just want to be in your presence mighty God I just want to bow before you you see all these words that we use for worship yeah it's leading to an encounter Glory to God. Glory to God. It's leading to a place of, of intimacy. And, and so what is true worship? What is true worship? What is true worship? It's an intimate connection. Write that down. It's an intimate connection. Worship is not a musical activity. Mm -mm -mm. Worship is not a musical activity. It is the function of the heart. Worship uh, is not the songs that you sing, it's not the music that you play, uh, it's not the dance that you dance, it's not the mind that you mind, no. Uh, worship uh, is not a musical uh, or an outward activity. Worship does not begin when the music starts uh, or when the praise team starts to sing. Uh, worship is not conceived uh, in the realm of music, uh, it affects music. It has an effect on music and we use music and singing as an expression of our worship. Worship is not conceived in the realm of music. No, no, no. Worship is conceived in the heart that has been born again. It's conceived in the life that has been given to the Lord. That's where worship takes place. Worship is about value. It's about worship worthiness how much value do you place on God how valuable is God to you is he precious to you are his words precious to you is the time that you spend with God precious to him or do you just run through your day and give God a little praise a thank you Jesus hallelujah but spend no time with God when you value you something uh, you attend to it uh, you take care of it uh, it's precious you're careful with it uh, you're careful with your life uh, that's why we're careful with our life uh, that's why we're careful with what we say uh, and we're careful with where we go uh, we're careful with what we do uh, because there is value uh, we value God I don't want to offend you God uh, I don't want to offend you I don't want to do nothing uh, to hurt your feelings when you love her uh, your spouse or you love that person that you're in relationship with you value them you value the time you spend with them you value those interactions and you go out of your way to ensure as humanly possible that you do nothing to hurt or offend them and when you do offend them which you will you because you love them and you value them you apologize you repent it don't take you long to repent to somebody that you really love and if we really love God if we really worship God we won't stay away from him because our heart is drawn to him it's gone further than just telling him how great he is and how wonderful he is my heart longs for you it longs for your presence I want to be where you are take the world but give me Jesus you are the greatest you are the love of my life Jesus you are the lover of my soul let me to thy bosom fly God I just want to be with you that's the heart of worship 
Oh, glory to God. That's the heart of worship. I don't need anybody to take me to the place of worship. I don't need a praise team. I don't need a musician. My heart sings to you. I will sing unto the Lord a new song. My heart worships you. My heart bows before you. My heart belongs to you and you alone and anything and anyone that comes in between me and you and this worship and this beautiful thing that we have they have to move they have to go God if it's a relationship it's got to end if it's money it's got to cease anything that comes between me and my worship has to be laid aside that's how valuable God is to me. How valuable is God to you? How much value do you put on your relationship with God? Because that's what worship is. Worship is to place value. Worship is to say you're worthy. You are worthy, God. You are worthy. Listen, the song, the songwriters penned it all for a thousand tongues. They said if we had a thousand tongues, we wish we had a thousand tongues to be able to sing your praise and to declare just how great you are. That's worship. That's worship. I said it earlier, everybody worships. So the question is not, are you worshiping? The question is, who are you worshiping? Who has your value? Who do you esteem as worthy? And are they worthy of that priority in your life? I don't know anyone that is more worthy than God. Anyone that is more worthy than Jesus. Uh, that's why the angels uh, and that's why the 24 elders and the beasts, glory to God, I feel the anointing. Uh, they, they cease not day nor night uh, crying worthy. Uh, you are worthy uh, for you alone have loosed the seals. Uh, you died for humanity. Uh, you are worthy. Uh, you are worthy. Uh, we were created uh, for your purpose pleasure thou art worthy O Lord to receive glory to receive honor and to receive praise for thou hast created all things glory to God there is no one that is more worthy of your worship and of your praise than Jehovah God no one more worthy than Jesus that took his own blood and rescued you are from a devil's hell. He alone should receive all your worship, all of your value. I will give you all my worship. Hallelujah. I will give you all my praise. I long to worship you. We long to worship you, God. We long to worship you. Our heart is drawn in God. Father, even at the mention of worship, our heart is drawn in. Even to teach, to preach, uh, my heart is drawn in. I just want to bow before your presence, God. Tell you how worthy you are. Hallelujah. Tell you how beautiful you are. I just want to be with you, God. Ah, God, I value those moments uh, of encounter where I encounter you, uh, where you pour into me uh, and I pour everything that I am uh, to you, oh God. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul rejoice. Take joy, my king. Hallelujah. In what you hear, let it be a sweet sound. My God, let my life be a sweet aroma. Let my life ascend to you. Let everything that I do, everything that I say, everything that I am, God, let it ascend to you. Uh, let it touch your heart, oh God. Oh God, I worship you. For you are beautiful. 
and you are worthy. Somebody just worship him right where you are. There's a spirit of worship right where you are. Come on, just enter into that worship. Enter in. Uh, enter in into that worship, into that connection, uh, into that encounter. Uh, God wants you to encounter him uh, on a different level and he wants to encounter you. Uh, there needs to be a divine exchange. Uh, glory to your name, Jesus. Uh, we worship you. We worship you. I got to move on. I got to move on, but I'm caught up in this worship. See, that's what worship does. It raptures you. Oh, hallelujah. When you begin to worship God, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. No agenda. Oh, hallelujah. When you get caught up in worship, hallelujah, nothing else matters. Everything fades away. Every other name fades away. Uh, everything else falls to the ground. Uh, in worship, we fall to our ground. Uh, my God, we fall to the ground. We fall to our knees. Uh, and we worship you. Receive our worship. Receive our worship. Hallelujah. I got to close this sermon. Let's look at the dual aspect of worship. There is a duplicity to worship. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Isaiah chapter 6. And from Isaiah chapter 6, hallelujah, from verse to 1, we see that there is a dual aspect. There is a duplicity to worship. Uh, he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple above him were seraph, seraphs each with six wings with two wings they covered uh, their faces with two they covered their feet uh, and with two they did fly and they were calling to one another crying holy 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 is the Lord almighty uh, the whole earth is filled with his glory and then in verse 5 Isaiah after seeing that he says whoa whoa he says woe is me for I am undone I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen my eyes have encountered the king the lord almighty then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand which he had taken with tongues from the altar and with it he touched my mouth and said see this has touched your lips your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for then i heard the voice of the lord saying whom shall i send and who will go for us and then said I here am I send me and, and, and so from that uh, we see that there is a dual aspect uh, Isaiah says I saw the Lord I saw God that is the aspect of revelation or awareness revelation worship is about revelation worship is about God revealing himself uh, that's what happened on the mount uh, of transfiguration uh, Jesus revealed uh, to his disciples his glory there is a revelation you can't be a worshiper and not receive revelation revelation comes as you worship God there's that aspect of revelation after Uzziah dies that's why you got to get rid of your Uzziahs but that's another sermon for another day he says when Uzziah dies when that blockage that thing that's blocking my view what's blocking your vision of God what stands between you you and your revelation of God uh, but Isaiah says uh, in the year uh, at that moment as soon as Uzziah got out of my way uh, I had a revelation of God uh, I saw God uh, and he sees him in his holiness uh, and he sees the angel crying holy 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 is the Lord and then uh, we come to the second uh, aspect of worship uh, and that is response 
And so worship is about revelation and response. Revelation and re do you see how far removed the worship is just from singing or music? It's not a musical activity. Worship is about a revelation of God. And after God reveals himself, then there must be a response. Nah, after Isaiah sees God, he has to respond. You can't see God and not respond. How can you? How dare we? When we had the opportunity to be in the building and to sit in God's presence and to see God, how dare we not respond to the glory of God? Listen, if you really love God, you can't see God and all who he is and all that he's done and not respond. No, Isaiah responds uh, and his response is that when I saw God, I saw myself. When I look at how wonderful and holy you are, I see how ruined I am. He cries, woe, woe, woe is me, for I'm undone. He sees because the, the worship of God and the revelation of God is so glorious. And glory means light and brilliance. And, and so when worship really occurs, when you really worship, nobody got to tell you about your sin. Nobody has to tell you about your faults. When you really worship God, it all comes out in the wash. When you really bow before God, when you really look at God, you look at yourself, you see yourself for exactly where you are. Don't you ever get caught up in the applause of people or who thinks you're greater. But when you worship God, you really see who you are. Isaiah responds, Hallelujah. And because he confesses who he is, you know, the Bible says if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And that's what we see happen here. The angels take a live coal and they sanctify him and they purge him. Hallelujah. And then you see the service now. You see the adoration of heart. You see the service now. God says, who will go for us? Who can I send? And he says, here am I. Send me and so there are there are movements through worship there are some things that ought to happen in your worship and i'm going to bring this sermon to a close because this could go on all day but there are some things that need to happen through your worship through your lifestyle of worship not your singing or your playing but your living your living an encounter with God, your lifestyle of worship. Uh, there are five, uh, there, there, there are some movements that, that we see uh, um, through this worship. Uh, there are, are, are four movements uh, exactly that we see uh, through Isaiah's experience. He says, I saw. The revelation of God. There's an awareness that comes. You become aware of God. And then he says, I cried. After you are aware, there comes confession. That cry is confession. You can't be a worshiper and not confess. Mm -mm. You can't be a worshiper and not be aware. You can't be a worshiper and not see God. And then when you see God, there's no confession. Absolutely not. If you are a worshiper, you will see and then you will cry. There will be a confession or an acknowledgement of who you are. And then after you, after you see, after you confess, then, there, then he says, I heard. Hearing means instruction. We hear instruction. Then you receive an instruction. You can't be placed on assignment unless you are a worshiper you can't be on an assignment for God unless you've seen God unless you've come to a place of confession in your life then you receive instruction from God and then comes commitment he says I said here am I send me do you see those four movements awareness confession instruction and commitment that's what worship is all about. This thing called worship is huge. I wish I had time. I wish I had time. So that is the dual aspect of worship. Uh, then there is the threefold vision of worship uh, that we see through Isaiah's uh, experience. Uh, uh, worship uh, has three visions. Write that down. Worship has three visions. The first one is a vision of God. The first thing he saw was God. Worship is all about God. 
not about anybody else. Worship is intimacy. Praise is running the aisles and dancing, dancing with everybody and shouting and high-fiving everybody and God is great and God is good. Worship, no. Worship, you bring it in. Worship, bring, worship becomes intimate. Worship becomes personal. Personal. He, he sees God. And, and, and so the threefold vision of worship uh, is that it is a vision of God. That means it is an upward journey. Worship is always upward first. Uh, it is an upward journey. That means you become God conscious. Write that down. In worship, I become God conscious. Secondly, uh, what, what did Isaiah see? He saw himself. After he saw God, he saw himself. Worship is a vision of self. In worship, when we really become worshipers, we see ourselves. That's an inward journey. The vision of God is an upward journey. The vision of self uh, is an inward journey. We become self-conscious. So worship means being God conscious and being self conscious. And then third, what does he say? He, he not only sees himself, he says, I am undone. I, I, I'm an unclean man. Then he says, and I dwell amongst people that are unclean. And so worship then brings to you a vision of the lust. Nah, can't be a worshiper if you don't have a heart for lust souls. He sees them. He sees those that are around him that are in the same state and condition as him. So worship, number one, is an upward journey. It is an inward journey and it is an outward journey. It is a vision of God. It is a vision of self and it is a vision of the world. That means we become God conscious. We become self conscious and we become world conscious. That's the threefold vision of worship. I've just got a few more things to share with you and then I'll let you go today. I hope that you're, you're learning and that you're being blessed by this, uh, this worship experience. Uh, what then is the ultimate priority of worship? There is an ultimate priority to worship. Worship has an assignment. Worship has an assignment. The assignment of worship is to counteract demonic activity. Worship's assignment is to put the devil in his place. Glory to God. Worship's assignment and the priority of worship is to bring everything back into order. And worship then is the ultimate priority of mankind, of humanity. That's the purpose for our creation. The Bible says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness or chaos was on the face of the deep. And, and so we know huh, that after, after the enemy, after Lucifer was cast out of heaven... And was thrown down to the earth. Uh, he brings his personality to God's creation. Uh, he brings his personality to God's world. Which is a personality of chaos. Of emptiness and of darkness. Uh, and, and man is now placed uh, in the earth as God's representative. That's why he's created in the image and in the likeness. Uh, the image likeness. The glory of God is upon man. Uh, and when the enemy saw man he saw the glory of God that's why he targeted man because man's assignment was to walk through the earth and to bring order back to a chaotic world uh, he was to replenish how do I know that the world existed before Adam got here God tells him replenish re refill that means it was filled before it was stocked it was loaded before but something has happened uh, to empty out uh, the world and creation from its former beauty and so God creates uh, a representative uh, of himself gives him power of attorney place him in the earth uh, and says reflect my glory 
reflect everything I am. I'm giving you dominion. Rada. Rada means to control. Rada means to override. I'm giving you the power, Adam, to override everything that the enemy does. And that's what your worship does. Your worship overrides the plans and the strategies and the workings of the enemy enemy uh, the ultimate priority uh, of worship uh, is to manifest the light of god uh, when we worship uh, when we worship every day uh, we are light bearers uh, we are manifesting the light uh, and the glory of god uh, in the earth glory to god uh, that's the ultimate priority uh, of worship and so the role then uh, of worship or the role of the worshiper you got a role as a worshiper. Your role is to replenish your earth, replenish your world, replenish your community, replenish uh, your home, your street, your workplace, anywhere you go. You're a replenisher. That's the, that's the assignment that he gave to Adam. That's the role of the worshiper to bring your world back into alignment. That's the power of your worship. Your worshiper has the power to bring things back into order, to bring them back into alignment. Yeah, yeah, you know, you've seen it happen. You've had a hard day or you're going through hard circumstances or situations, but something inside you just begins to worship God and then you see everything clearly everything comes back uh, into place uh, that's the role uh, of the worshiper uh, the role of the worshiper is to bring light uh, back uh, to the earth uh, the role of the worshiper is to be a reflector uh, every worshiper is a reflector uh, you you receive the glory of God and you reflect it uh, into your world you reflect it uh, into your neighborhoods you reflect it uh, into your communities uh, you are a reflector you are placed in the earth to comprehend to understand and to control not to be affected by your world but to control your world and to reflect the glory and the light of God this is the agenda that he gave to Adam in the beginning isn't it didn't he give him seven perfect instructions he tells him be fruitful then he says multiply fill the earth subdue the earth have dominion tend the garden and name all things uh, he gives him seven powerful and perfect instructions uh, tells him adam walk through your world and that's what you got to do worshiper walk through your world uh, walk through your community uh, your world now that's filled and ravaged uh, by this pandemic and this virus walk uh, through your world and be fruitful don't you stop being fruitful because of corona uh, uh, because of any kind of virus no walk through your world uh, and be fruitful and multiply you got to reproduce yourself uh, multiply the earth uh, then he says fill the earth uh, everywhere you go fill it with worship uh, fill it with the knowledge of God uh, fill every place you go uh, with the glory of God subdue the earth uh, that means have control don't be subdued uh, by anything or anyone but you subdue control your world uh, you have the power to control your appetite uh, to control your desires uh, to control temptation uh, subdue the earth uh, have dominion uh, step on the devil uh, stomp on the devil uh, dominate your world uh, dominate your life uh, dominate your gifting everywhere you go God has given you the spirit to dominate uh, he says maintain the garden uh, tend and keep it everything that God has given you maintain it uh, and maximize it for the glory of God uh, and then the seventh instruction uh, is he gives him the power to name all things as you worship God God is going to give you supernatural insight that you're going to know exactly what this is. He's going to give you discernment uh, on another level. God tells Adam, I'm giving you the power to name things. I'm giving you the power to call 
things that aren't as if they were. I'm giving you the power to say what that is and what it should do. I'm giving you the power, Adam, to say that's a horse. I'm giving you the power to say that's a donkey. I'm giving you the power to name all things. Because when I blew my breath into you, I blew my intelligence into you. I don't have time to teach this. When God blew into Adam the breath of God, when God blew when God blew his ruach into Adam, when he blew into him, he blew intelligence. He blew his DNA into Adam. Hallelujah. And so Adam had the same wisdom of God and so when Adam looked at whatever he looked at he saw it through the eyes of God because he had the breath of God he had the intelligence of God he had the DNA of God and as a worshiper glory to God you have the breath of God breathe into me oh breath of God you have the spirit of God and so you can see as God sees there are many scholars that say what God blew into Adam was blood uh, that he blew his blood uh, into him his divine DNA because DNA uh, is carried uh, in the blood uh, and so uh, the first Adam uh, had forfeited his assignment but look now uh, here comes the second Adam uh, and how does he bring us access uh, back to the mind of God it is through uh, his blood uh, we are covered uh, with the blood of Jesus uh, we've got the blood uh, of Jesus we have the mind uh, of God uh, we have the Holy Spirit uh, living inside us uh, as worshipers. Uh, we have the power to name all things. I'm done. I want to tell you as a worshiper, I want you to catch this, that you have an assignment. And your assignment is beyond singing pretty songs. Nothing against songs of worship and songs of praise nothing against choirs and and i i love to sing but my assignment goes beyond singing as a worshiper i've got to understand that my assignment is my lifestyle there's an assignment there's a way i'm supposed to live there is a code of behavior that i'm supposed to have you are employed by the holy spirit to use your worship to create the same atmosphere that exists in heaven on the earth. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, as it is in heaven, so let it be on the earth. You are employed, worshiper, by the Holy Spirit to create the same atmosphere in the earth, in your community, in your home, in your society, the same atmosphere that exists in heaven. Your assignment is to view heaven and then implement it on the earth. Your assignment is to look into heaven and then implement it on the earth. That's the power of worship. You're an atmosphere changer. You're an atmosphere changer through your worship. I pray that this short series has blessed your heart and that it's challenged you to understand praise and to understand worship. This is what everyone needs to know about praise and worship. And there's so much more that you can know, but this is essential. Father, we honor you today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your glory and your honor. We thank you for who you are. We praise you indeed. We give you the utmost praise, mighty God. We praise you for your mighty acts and your mighty deeds. Uh, we praise you, Lord God, with the timbrel and the dance. We, we praise you with the harp, uh, my God, and the lute. We praise you with our voices. We praise you with singing. We praise you with dancing. We praise you with drama. Everything that has breath praises you, mighty God. But we don't stop at praise. Uh, our praise takes us to the destination of worship, mighty God. And as we worship you, we thank you that there is an encounter. There is a divine exchange. We thank you for the things that you're depositing into us. Mighty God, we thank you that we can exchange uh, all of our filth and all of our sadness and all of our sorrow for your joy and for your power, mighty God, and for your victory. Thank you for the divine exchange uh, that comes through worship, uh, mighty God. And as we worship you, we see you. Uh, we receive revelation of who you are. And mighty God, we don't just receive revelation, but we respond. Uh, we respond and ultimately we say, here am I, send me. God, we respond to you. Uh, we 
see you. We confess, Almighty oh God, uh, and then we hear you, uh, and then we are assigned, Mighty God. Uh, we honor you, God. We understand uh, that the ultimate priority of our worship, uh, my God, is to reflect light, uh, is to be light bearers. Uh, mighty God, we understand that you've given us assignment uh, to walk through our world and to bring it back uh, into alignment. Uh, we understand that your blood, uh, Jesus, uh, by your blood, uh, you have given us a, an assignment. You've employed us uh, to create uh, the same atmosphere that exists in heaven on the earth. Uh, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice uh, that they would be worshipers uh, in spirit and in truth. More than just singers, uh, my God, more than just musicians, but worshipers. Uh, that our worship would be for real, my God, and that our worship would change uh, our world. This is my prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. If you're going to be a worshiper, you got to give your life to the Lord. If you're not in a living or an active relationship with Jesus, it's simple. It's simple. It's inviting him in. It's saying, Jesus, come into my life. I thank you that you are the access to God, that you are the access to the original intention for my life and for the reason that I'm here. And I accept you now. I ask you to forgive me of all of my wrongdoings, of all of my sin, and to cleanse me through your blood. Your blood that was shed to take away my sins, and you were buried to carry my sins away. I believe it, that you rose on the third day, hallelujah, with victory for my life and my future. I believe it. I believe that you're coming again in power, but until you do, I believe that I'm here to be a reflector of your love and of your glory and your power. I accept that assignment now in Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you agreed with that prayer, we want to hear from you. Just type in, I'm saved, or I prayed the prayer, or I need to talk to someone, or I don't understand, or I need counsel, or whatever your need is, we want to hear from you. God bless you as you move forward in praise and worship.